are uh, Russ Kleiman and Kelly Allred. Russ is actually a ER, uh, general surgeon. So if anybody cuts himself on the side, <laughs> Russ and Russ would take care of you. Just don't have a heart attack. Um, but he lives in Silver City and got moved there, what, 20 years ago, you said? And liked to hike, but he didn't know the plants. So he met somebody else who knew the plants but didn't know about hiking. So he learned, and now he's retired from medicine and is teaching as an adjunct professor tax, uh, plant taxonomy at Western New Mexico University in Silver City. And he's become quite the expert on firefights. Don't know what it is, hang on. And Kelly is a retired professor from New Mexico State University in range science down in Las Cruces. And they like to go mossing together. They will be mossing tomorrow morning. <coughs> If anybody wants to tag along after this inspiring talk tonight, you can meet them at the K-Town parking lot at 9 o'clock. I've given the time and place, and you can tell them what to expect. Well, we're very happy to be here with you, and contrary to what you may have understood, Russ is going to do most of the talking. He can talk for both of us. Okay, so... But uh, we thought, since we're here, this would be a great opportunity to go up. Is that like the twining road that we're going to to go up there and just moss wherever we can and find uh, whatever we can find? So you're very welcome just to come along with us. We'll just let you do what we do, and we'll talk to you about what we're seeing and uh, and just have a good time together. And we'll just go as far as I guess the snow or the roads. Or I guess. Snow right now. Yeah, well, we should be able to go. From the parking lot, how far can we go? I don't You ski down to the parking lot. I mean, where we're meeting. No, oh, no. The K Town is just at the intersection. Yeah, yeah so we're going to start there. And 10 just, miles to we're just going to head up. So we may get what? Eight miles? Or? We don't know. We're just going to go and see what's what. Yes. 8,000 feet, four to six inches. Okay, so we just won't maybe go that far. We'll just see what we can see. We're very flexible. <laughs> you so, be here. Today, you well, we're day only day. here t tomorrow, see, and so we're just going to make use of whatever we can do. And there got to be some losses somewhere there. Yes? I have two 14 foot rock walls in my house with lichen on So if you guys run out of too much snow, you can just come to my house. We'd be happy to bring our chisels. And no. take that <laughs> to get those lichens, but yeah, generally we're not doing too much of the lichens. Uh, but, so the point being that we're happy just to let you come along, and you can just do what we do, and we'll just show you what. And they may be back this summer. Yeah, hopefully we'll come yeah, back this summer. There's some interesting meetings. things up there at the, at the ski area, and uh, people have been mossing there since a long time ago, and so great to be here. That's the last word you'll hear me speak. That's it. <laughs> That's. Thank you, everybody. Can you hear me? All hear me? I know it's pretty loud. All right. My name is Russ. I'm here from Silver City. Thank you all. Whether you know it or not, you've already wined and dined us today. And you're also putting us up here, so we appreciate the hospitality. Can I turn the lights down a little bit? There are two things in this title slide. There are bryophytes, that's a word you might not know, and the Tau Ski Area, that's a word I, I imagine you do know. And as a test, can anybody tell me where this picture was taken? Uh oh. <laughs> Ski balance. It's too dark to see their hands. Yes. <laughs> this is taken at the top of the, of the, of the bottom ski lift, right? It's so about 11,000 feet. Mm -hmm. Looking across, so tell us we have. Ski guys down underneath in there, in that little crevice. We're looking across the valley. Okay, we know what the Tau Ski Valley is here. What about bryophytes? That's a big word. It refers to three different types of plants. We, we lump them together, but they are not the same thing. They're not even the, they're not the same lineage. Scientists are arguing just how well, how closely they're related, but for most purposes, they are not that closely related. This is a moss. A picture there. Notice that mosses have leaves. They have stems. They have these funny things sticking up, sticking out that we call capsules. Those turn out to be reproductive structures. 
And if you look at it like this, it looks like any other plant almost, doesn't it? There are a few things to notice though. You can actually see through these leaves almost. They're only one cell thick. So they're not differentiated in the plants of cell layers you see in plant leaves out in the garden here. We still call them leaves. Here's a moss you have up in the ski area parking lot. It looks a little more opaque. It's still a moss. It still has a stem, it still has leaves. This is a liverwort. They look a lot like mosses, but after a while you can tell them apart just by looking at them, usually. The leaves come up more opposite on the stem, and the leaves themselves are more rounded, usually. Excuse me. Yes, you. Oval one yeah. way or the other. Yeah, good. Thing. Am I out of everybody's way? So, a little more. Aim at the camera. In the beginning, these can be hard to tell from the mosses, but with time you can tell little warts from mosses pretty easily. Hornworts, see this gummy bear with the shiny thing in here? A little amorphous. This is moss around the edges with the leaves. This amorphous looking gummy bear thing, that's a, liver, uh, a hornwort. You can see these horn like things coming out. We'll talk more about the question marks at, at the end here in just a moment. Okay, having said that, do we have them here in the Tawaski Valley? Wow. You have them everywhere in the Tawaski Valley. You got great ones and some pretty rare ones. See this green lining along everything here? See this carpet of green here? It's like somebody carpeted the edge of everything here. That's liverworts, mosses, you name it, bryophytes in there. Okay? You've got bryophytes everywhere. Here's a picture from the top of Wheeler Peak. Look inside the crevices of that little structure that has been built to protect you from the wind at the very top. See a little piece missing right there? If you ever wondered what a sign, the sign of the, the fact that there has been a, someone mossing somewhere, that's the sign that someone has been mossing right before you. Oh my gosh. <laughs> In this case, it was someone I was with who took a piece out before I got a picture taken. And by the way, John Ugalaka, this is the same moss you brought in. Okay. This has turned out to be a very common moss. Here's another creek up in the Tauski area. Everybody, I hope, has now seen moss everywhere in that photograph. All the rocks are covered on the sides, inside the stream, there's mosses everywhere. Here's a rock from the parking lot at the ski area, just above the parking lot. There are easily a dozen species of mosses on that one. Anything that looks like it's a slightly different color is in fact probably a different species. There's all kinds of mosses on that one. And liverworts. Anybody recognize this view? You've all climbed, or a lot of you climbed up or hiked up that trail to Wheeler Peak, right? This is looking back down toward Williams Lake, this little kidney bean shaped thing down here. That's Williams Lake. Where you hike into is right here. That's the trail in. Here's where this little stream comes in and makes a little wetland. So I'm hiking in, and there's where the stream comes in, and there's a wetland. And my goodness, you have interesting things in there. Mosses, liverworts. I'll show you a state of record liverwort that just came out of here uh, last July. There's all kinds of stuff in here that's not been seen before in this area. And besides, it's just a great, beautiful place to go. And it's only two miles from the park. This is the top of the parking lot. There's a stream that comes through here, there's a stream that comes over here. That rock I showed you before is right over here. And along here, all kinds of great mosses and river rocks, especially up in this area. And I'm taking this picture from the parking lot at the trailhead to Williams Lake. This is a great place to find what happens. And not a bad place to see rainbows. Okay, well, so what are these things we see? Now, just a short disclaimer. You're not going to leave here being able to identify every moss in the Towski area. That's not really my purpose. I just want to give you some idea of what you've got here. Maybe get you interested in looking at something. 
This is a moss that one of the problems with looking at mosses compared to vascular plants, or what are called vascular plants, is that most mosses don't have a common name. It would be nice if I could tell you that this is a poop moss, because it turns out that's what it is. <laughs> I can't tell you that though. This is some, simply Taylorea humanata. Its Latin name is the best I can do. Some people might say it's a Taylorea moss. We can, we can call it that, but Taylorea. This is what looks like wet. <coughs> when you moss, you have to figure out what things look like when they're wet and when they're dry. This is exactly the same moss. This is dry, that's wet. This is perfectly alive. And if you put a drop of water on this, it would take a little while, maybe a few seconds, a minute, it would turn into this. What can you tell about this? Well, stems and leaves. Looks like there are some mid veins here. Very translucent, right? One cell thick. You can even get an idea that some of these leaves have some teeth at the top, can't you? If you look real careful. This moss isn't very common in this day. It's known from Red River and from here. And if you peel off a leaf and look at it under 40X, here's what you get. It looks a lot like a few of the other mosses that we have in this day, if you just look at this leaf. If you tear a leaf off the stem, that's what it looks like. If you leave the leaf on the stem and tear the stem away, you're looking at the leaf axis. So what I've done here is I've torn, torn the stem here. Here's the leaf on the opposite side of the stem. You're looking into where the leaf comes off the stem. Anybody get where I, how this is oriented now? Here's the stem. Here I've cut the stem. Here's the leaf on the opposite side of the stem coming off. And one of the things that's unique about this moss is it has these two bright red cells at the bottom of hairs where the leaf meets the stem. And you can almost see a little ghost of the clear hyaline cells that make out the rest of the hairs here, but there are, there are further cells that go up from the red cell. The red cells are hard to see in the projection, easier to see in the computer. This family, many of the members live on poop or on old animal bones, and they make sticky spores that stick to insects and insects disperse them. They eat the big odor to attract flies. First found in 1981, this particular species is the only species of this family known in New Mexico. And the nice thing for Kelly and I, or Kelly and me, is that this one is not found on dung. <laughs> if you're collecting it, you'll understand why that's nice. <laughs> Next slide. Now I mentioned that, that that leaf looks a lot like some other mosses in New Mexico, but you can tell it apart by the reproductive structures. This one is covered in these little green dots, which are spores. That's how mosses make new mosses. These are all spores. A little cap right there is popped off. A little column in the middle of the, of the cap so you can see right there. You see this little crown of little of more green spores? They're actually coating hairs. And over here, you can see some of these hairs. Next slide. What happens with these hairs is that they react to moisture and to changes in environmental temperature. And they move very quickly. In my plant taxonomy class, when I ask my students, what makes a plant? What is a plant? I sometimes get, and especially from younger kids, I get, well, they don't move very fast. Well, I just touch the arrow there. So it should, I'm hoping it'll bring up. Now, before you click it, before you click it, see these hairs here? Now, you have to be kind of opportunistic when you do this kind of thing. This is just holding my cell phone up to that dissecting scope when I was at home. This happened to happen while I was watching it, and I wasn't going to miss it, so this is just my cell phone held up to the, to the microscope. So, it, it isn't the greatest video, but you get the idea. Watch these hairs. Watch how fast these move. This is real time. This isn't sped up. There you go. There we go. Get ready. Watch these guys move. That's real time. Wow. So 
Spooky. Those things are, are they do that to this for the spores. That's pretty fast for a plant. That's real time. Go to the next slide. There are other mosses that do similar things. Here are some leaves of a genus called Centricia. This is exactly the same moss that we have for a demo on at the back after the talk. So you can do this yourself under the scope there. So here's a moss. These are leaves on the stem. When they're dry, they're all closed like an umbrella closed. Right? The leaves all kind of half twisted up the stem. Each one of these is a separate stem with the leaves twisted up. Each leaf has a little white ball or hair point on top of it. This is the dry appearance. Watch what happens when you wet this down, how fast it not only opens up, but how it turns color. And for reference, these are the last ones that open up. So here's my eyedropper bringing water down. One drop, boom. That's what it looked like to start with. You know, that was going to start opening pretty quick too. The color change is mostly an optical illusion. But what's happening is the leaves are rapidly absorbing the water. The cells at the base of the leaf are not the same size and shape as the rest of the cells of the leaf, and so it pulls the leaves open. I see it again? No? Okay. Move on. Okay. So one of the things I want to impress upon you is that it's not that hard to tell different mosses apart. Some people told me that they were surprised there was anything besides one moss. There are 350 moss species or so in the state of New Mexico. There are lots of mosses here. Remember that leaf of the Pelorian? It didn't look at all like any of this. These stems don't look at all the same, do they? This is Dystictum campylaceum, and this moss was less than a foot from the Pelorian. So you have no trouble calling these two apart. If you pull out one of those stems, this is what it looks like. It doesn't look at all like the Peloria, right? You could tell that apart, couldn't you? Sure. These leaves are clasping at the base and then mostly just mid vein above there. They come off on two sides. Known from here and from a few other locations. Now, those leaves come off from two sides and are clasping at the base. If you do a cross section, go back to this a second. If I do a cross section right through here, you're going to see the base of that leaf, the base of that leaf. Since they're clasping, you're going to see them almost hugging each other. And the stem, in this case, I've removed the stem. If you go next, so that's what this is: a cross section of that part of the stem, and you have the clasping part of this leaf, the clasping part of the opposite side of the leaf, and the mid vein. Here you have the stem itself that I pulled out. It was a little bit busy in here, so I pulled that out to take a picture of it. Now, why did I put this slide in here? It wasn't to show my prowess making cross sections. The reason I put this in here is because the, the difference between a vascular plant and a non-vascular plant <laughs> isn't quite as clear cut as you might think. Vascular plants, we think of those as having veins, right? Holman's island, that all should sound familiar, maybe. I want to carry water, well, it carries nutrients and salt, dissolved substances, right? That sound vaguely familiar from a few years back? Okay. If you look at the stem, it has these great big old balloon shaped cells outside, but you see this area that looks like the edge on the inside? Those are water soluble conducting long narrow cells. They go up and down the stem quite a ways. These are very, they look like little dots here, but they're actually elongate tubes, like a capillary tube. These carry soluble water. If you look at these leaf cross sections, well, here's the sheathy part of the leaf. They have chlorophyll, they're doing their job. There are structural cells. These really little itty bitty guys in here, the really thick cell walls, those are there to give that, so it's not like an octopus. That leaf stands out and makes a nice, firm structure, rigid structure, semi-rigid structure. But you see a little gray, irregular area right there? That's a water conducting area. There are cells in there to conduct water. We call these hydroids. We don't call them tracheids. We don't get to call them vascular plants because they don't have a special substance in them called liquid. But if they had this really complex substance called lignin, and they had therefore what we call tracheids, 
this would not be called a monomaster, it would be called a master. They do conduct solute and water, dissolve substance in water up and down the plant. They just don't do it with the kinds, the exact same kinds of structures you find in plants out there. this plant, if you go up from Williams Lake and start up toward um, Wheeler Peak, you only have to go about two or three hundred yards from over to a rock. It's just absolutely covered in kind of a grayish green moss. If you take a look at it with your hand lens, this is what you'll see. Dreamy alpestris, living at 11,000 feet. That leaf looks different yet, doesn't it? That doesn't look like I think in the thing we had just a bit vein almost. It doesn't look like a Teloria either. In fact, down here it looks a little bit like Teloria, but up here you can't even see through it. It's not all mid -vein. What's going on? Well, it's two cells thick up there. So it's not as translucent. If you have a two cell thick, this is a cross section. Right there. Is that right there? Get up with that. A little bit of the mid vein is missing. The cells are bulging and the, and the leaf is two cells thick. Another moss that isn't found in too many places around the state. And I wish I could really do this moss justice, Hylicomium. This is just a really pretty moss. What happens with this moss is the next year's growth grows out of the back of the stem of the previous year's growth. So if that's this year's growth, something grows right out of the back of that to make the next year. The next year grows like that. They have this amazing stair step appearance of the plant. And you really only see three years of growth here, but you get the idea how the stem keeps on coming out of the back of the previous year's stem. And the effect when you see this out in the wilderness is just really pretty. This is a very pretty moss. Is this peat moss? Nope. Uh, there are, in fact, a couple species of peat moss up in Gladys Caldera. I don't think it's going to anywhere else in the city. You wouldn't be alive without peat moss. All that carbon that's, all that carbon dioxide that's, that's uh, trapped in the different areas of the world that keeps the CO2 out of the atmosphere and makes it live here because of that. Anyway, let's we'll hear it for peat moss. Let's hear it for peat moss. Yeah. But this is not, oh, oh sorry, that's all right, that's what you can leave there. If you take just one of those little branches out and look at it, you get this. Now, this is what you see if you were a mite or an ant, looking down onto one branch of that hylocomium splendid stair step type moss, this is what you'd see. Here what's happening, this is called dark fields, where the light is above you. Typical microscope here, this is the same stem as either that one or that one, I can't remember which one of these, probably that one. If you would take a typical microscope view again, have the light underneath the stage, you're looking through your plant, through your subject down at the light, that's a typical microscope view. That's what this is. Here, instead of looking down through your subject down the line, the light's above you. That's the only difference between these two slides. Otherwise, you do the same thing. You get a whole different view, though. This is what you see from your hand. It looks like this, this moss has its shade. You see, it looks like stubble. It's a five o'clock shadow. It looks like me right now. Right? See all the stubble on these leaves? What that is, is the ends of cells poking out. So if here's one cell, this one doesn't quite overlap perfectly, it actually sticks out a little bit here. And you can kind of see that starting to happen over here. You can also see that the little hair is coming off the stem here. It's not just leaves. See these little hairs here? That's to help lift water off the stem. They're called paraphilia. If you take an even higher magnification look at the leaf, this is now 400x. These are the ends of the cells. These are now very elongate, skinny, long cells, as opposed to Hilaria, which are brick-shaped cells. You can see the ends of these things are poking out. Here's one leaf. I want you to try to remember that leaf for a second. I'm going to show you another one just like it. There's a mid vein that's short and split into two, two sections. We call that a short double constant. It has this funny nose at the end. And it has it's almost a lip lips. Those paraphilia, those hairs, look like this. Now another moss growing right next to that one, at 
the Epcot area, actually, the Pinellas Key area, looks like this. That doesn't look at all like this. There's Step Moss, does it? You would mistake this for that beautiful stair step. It just looks like a map. That looks like a rug that needs to be replaced in my house. That looks like. But if you look at the leaf, now how does how close does that look like to the island of Omen? This is now Florosi tree bright. Darn it, that leaf does look exactly the same. Except it doesn't have the cell end spoken out. Okay? The cell end spoken out, the big word for that is prorate. It doesn't have the prorate cells. Otherwise, that leaf is a split image of how the filament blend is. You can't really tell very easily, but what's going on here is the edges are folded in over the top, except at the very tip. Hard to tell on this, a 400x view. Hard to tell, but if I focus it up a little bit, you can see how the edges are folded in, except at the very tip. Corrosion <coughs> tree bride. The amazing thing, the, 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 what makes this moss easy to recognize in the field, to me anyway, is when it's wet, the, the stems are bright red and shine right through those yellow green leaves. So if you're looking at it from the light, you see bright red stems shine. These two are also wet at the parking lot at the Wheeler Peak Trail, Lake, uh, Williams Lake Trail. They look pretty similar, but this has a little hair pointer on it, not in the leaves. Of it. So right from the outset, you say, well, I think those two are different. They look pretty similar. They almost look like little palm trees to me. They've got leaves on the stem. They come all the way around the stem. They're not flat like that, but they stick to it. But this one doesn't have the hair point, and that one does. Both turn out to be completely different. This is poultry castor, that's poultry. There are other differences as well. Dark field photograph. It's not going to show up as much as well as I was hoping. Well, you can just get a, a feel for the fact that there are about 30 lines. It looks like there are lines in there, or is it too hard to tell? There's 30 parallel lines, bright yellow lines here, separated by darker lines, on this part of the leaf. They're going to turn out to be plates of photosynthetic cells. Here, the edges of the leaf are just out like that. Here, there are air bubbles trapped in here. You get a little bit of a sense. What's going on is the leaf is actually folding over those, those 30 sheets. So, the easy to tell difference in the field, here is just no hair point and the leaf is flat. And if you cross-section on those, on those leaves, Here's the flat one, where the edges are not folded over. Now the 30 plates, they look like just filaments if you cross section. Take a, if you take a bath mat, stand it in, and cross it, just cut it, look at it on the edge, it'll just look like a single line. So you're looking at these 30 sheets on the edge. Here, it's folded over. It's hard to tell again, but there's a lot of bumps. We call those papillae on the top cell here. Near their school. These are shaped like beer bottles. If you remove one of those sheets and turn it on its side now, you can see how it's a sheet, the top cell is rounder, it has bumps on it, here are those beer bottles I was talking about. Not known to very many places in the state of New Mexico. Are you getting the feeling that most of these mosses, a lot of the ones we're seeing, are only known to a few places in the state? There's a reason for that, because they're only known to a few places in the state. That's why we like them. It's a special kind of place. If you go to the, the peaks, some of the higher areas, you'll find this centricia. This is the same moss that I showed you, the same genus as the moss I showed you rapidly spreading the leaves out. The same genus is the one we'll show you in the second slope out there. It has red hair points. <coughs> there you go. It also has the Edges of leaf strongly curled over, and you can tell there are lots of bumps. We call these papillae on the cells. So a strongly curved over, we call that revolute cell uh, leaf margin, and papillo cells. Here's what the leaf looks like. We're going to do the second scale. Has these what we call hyaline windows at the bottom, and that great big long hair. That doesn't look like anything you've seen either, does it? They all look different. 
Why? Because they all do look different. Mosses aren't that hard to tell apart from the microscope until maybe you get to some species that are very similar. But from the standpoint of <coughs> families and genera, they're not that hard to tell apart, especially in the microscope. And a lot of them you can tell apart just from the handlings in the field. On the liverworts. Liverworts are a lot like mosses. The only ones so far that we've seen up here, as I recall, look a lot like mosses because they have leaves and stems. But there are whole classes of liverworts, whole groups of liverworts that don't look like that. They look like flat ribbons. They're more arid area liverworts. And the ones that are in more wet areas, like you have around here, are going to have stems and leaves, like you have here. This and this, these two are two species in the same genus, and I can tell you they will look almost identical when they're both wet. This one's dry, that one's wet. If you wet that down, it's going to look like that. The reason I put this dry picture up here is you can see these little brown circles in here. These are little structures that are intended to disperse and asexually reproduce. We call those gemmy corpaculum. So every one of these little guys that's brown can be easily broken off to form a whole new little bit. On um, this particular liverwort, you don't have any great big cell at the end of the lobes. Now notice how this is wider than it is long. This is a leaf of the liverwort. You almost never have a moss leaf wider than long. So as soon as you see this leaf, you think of liverwort. Okay. Kelly, five seconds. Moss leaf, wider than long. That's what I mean. We don't have very many of them. It's hard to think of one. They don't do that. <clears throat> it's a different species. Notice how this one has a long, clear cell at the end of the lobes. This one doesn't really does it. And you also have these little hairs coming off the edges of this leaf that don't over here. This is a different one than this. Different species, same genus. These can be hard to tell except under the microscope. But you can tell the genus of this in the field, especially if you see those brown genetic uh, forms. Asexual reproductive notches. And if you look, if you do a dark field photograph, and now the light is above you, you've seen what you look like, you see what you you're seeing now what you see if you were an ant looking down at the leaf with the sun at your head, there is one of those brown structures that disperses and makes a whole new plant. Turns out there's several several cells in there. So this is a one of the gemmy, one of the red brown gemmy part of the hatchera. Underneath the stem, so in a liverwort, you can have leaves on either side, you can even have a leaf coming off right in the middle of the stem. We call those underleaves. Here's an underleaf with all these hairlike projections. These are up here just to show you some of the weirder things. Here's another little one. This one what does that look like? It looks like sargassum seaweed or maybe a sea monster. This is a liverwort, but the leaves are deeply split these hair-like segments. This is up. We got this just, just before you got to Williams Lake in the rocks. This is a liverwort that has never been, never been seen before in this state. News state record that was collected by Kirsten Roman in, in August of last year. And identified by Dr. Karen Blisser, who's the state liverwort expert, who's happens to be my wife. His <laughs> companion here. What makes, what makes Scampani interesting, most liverworts, see that what's happening here is part of the leaf is folding over itself. So there's a big lobe and a small lobe. They're actually connected along that border. And it's just folded over. Most liverworts that do this, the larger lobe is on top. You know, down on the lower, the small lobe is on bottom. This is exactly the opposite. The, lower, the small lobe in this genus is on This is just in case anybody hadn't seen the dark, didn't, wasn't really good, a dark field. Here's transmitted, here's dark field, and I just made the black in the background white so you can see it from there. This is what you see if you're an ant looking down on it. This is what you look like if you're a biologist looking through a scope. And leaves of a different uh, liverwort, again, round. You don't see this shaped leaf commonly among mosses, and most, though not all mosses, will have a midvein, at least some short midvein. There are some mosses without a midvein, 
But if you don't see it in the name, especially see a round leaf, you're looking for the word. Here's an underleaf. Look at the long projections. And this is, this is the leaf you find right down the middle of the stem. Hornworts. Hmm. What can I say about hornworts? I, I need to show you a picture of a hornwort. I already did that. Why am I fidgeting? You don't have any pictures. There aren't any in New Mexico. Every, there probably are. You can be famous. Because hornworts, there are hornwort species over in Arizona. There are hornwort species over in Colorado. There are hornwort species over in Texas. How many hornwort species are north of New Mexico? You think they're here in every state around us? You bet. All you have to do is find the first one, and your name goes up in lights. At least, at least in New Mexico, a lot. However, there is no cash award. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the race is on amongst us thousands of biologists. I'm kidding. Amongst the three or four of us in the state that are looking for The race is on to find the hardware. And frankly, this is one of the places that's most likely where do hormones like to live? Where there's somewhere that has most of the time, and it's moist most of the time. Roadside ditches, they love disturbed areas. Roadside ditches that have, have water sitting in them much of the year. That's a hornwort paradise. That, that gummy bear like thing with those little green horns sticking out. I should have to get it. That, you see that in a roadside ditch with just water in it. It's only going to be about that big. But if you're looking down there staring at some other plants, see something that looks like a gummy bear with a horn sticking out, you just get a really important scope. It's going to be around here on the northern tier of the state somewhere. Go find them. So in terms of what's in the back here, there's all kinds of things for you to look at. There are a whole raft of books back there. All there are resources you can look through and see how you, there are keys in it, just like the basket. There's, there's not much difference between collecting and looking at mosses compared to looking and collecting basket plants. In fact, the plants that we consider the flowering plants in the woods. That whole left side of the table is all kinds Books. The one that says preliminary key to the mosses of New Mexico, done by a couple of reprobates, yes. uh, that one isn't available. This is kind of a plenary version of just kind of testing the working on the mosses in New Mexico. Uh, there's a whole shoebox full of different mosses there for you can look at. You want to see if you can tell them apart just by looking at them. 101, you can the answer is yes. You're going to be able to look at those mosses. I know that doesn't look like that one. Like to convince yourself that there is also a Selagionella in there uh, just to throw you off key over. There's uh, my collection bag back there with a hand, hand lens in it. There is a paper called uh, Bossing the Gila First Year. What that is is a, is a little essay I wrote after I really did it. I learned losses for one year. Things I learned that I figured I could save other people who want to learn about losses. Trouble I can save you if you're trying to figure out how to identify monsters. Things, little secrets that they don't tell you. You figure out yourself. I put those down on paper, and there's one on the back there, but it's downloadable from the moss section of the website called helaflora.com. Which I mean. Uh, and there's also a moss that John Bublocker brought. A very common moss throughout the state that's spread on the furious. We actually have that in our backyard. It's a good one to see because a lot of you will really recognize it's something you have and that you organize. And the last thing on the very right, there's something that's a lot of fun. Remember I showed you that video of an eyedropper putting the water on the hair point moss and everything suddenly opens up and turns bright green? That exact moss lives in my backyard. I thought I was in trouble last night because it was raining in Silver City. I wanted to get some of that dry stuff out of there, so I could bring it up here, and it was all wet and looked great. <laughs> the nice thing is it dried out overnight and dried out the car right now. It's perfectly dry now, so it looks like those umbrellas that have been all curled up. So what I've got there is a dissecting scope, some of those moss stems, uh, pipe pen, not pipe pen, what do they call it? Not a water pen, eyedropper, something like that. And what you can do is take a couple of those stems, turn on the dissecting scope, get it focused. 
before your eyes. Put a couple of stems down there. Make sure it's too focused. Don't drop water on it first, because what you'll see is the whole thing is done in about a second and a half. So if you drop water and then look, it's going to all be green and all out of water. This is a very fast thing that happens. Those, those leaves are only one cell thick. So they absorb water directly across the leaf itself. They don't have, they don't have roots to absorb, absorb the water. It's going to go right into the leaf. That happens very quickly. So have fun with that. It's one of the more fun things you can do early on when you look at mosses to see how fast mosses can absorb water, change color, spring to life. It goes from dead looking little nothing, almost like a dead piece of dust, to a nice green plant in your eyes. How long can they last in their dried state? Uh, years? Um, Centuries? Try. I believe the longest number I've heard is on the order of thousands of years. So, so you've heard about the Athabascan Glacier up near, uh, what's that lake up there? Calgary, up Jasper. Lake Louise. Lake Louise. So if you pass Lake Louise, you get up to the Athabascan Glacier. It's because you head up toward Jasper. Well, something else than that. They've now collected moss at the base as the, You've heard the glaciers are receding, right? So the mosses and other what's left of plants is becoming uncovered as that glacier recedes. There are mosses there that are perfectly viable that have sprung to life as that glacier. Those are areas that haven't seen clay, well, haven't been dumped <coughs> under ice for over 400 years. So the first hint that something funny was going on was when mosses that were under ice for 400 years right below. If that wasn't the norm, recently there's been a group that, can, that has gone into Antarctica to check out areas that have been under ice for, what's that paper? I think it was 3,000 years. I, I honestly can't remember the number of years. It was some incredibly large amount of time, something like 3,000 years, that hadn't been out for other ice. And the moss is going right below. Are they the same species? Is this the same? Yeah. Well, 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 some of them are. Actually, one of them is what John did for. They're pretty basic. It's amazing. So a, a related question is, how do you tell if a moss is dead? I don't know that anybody knows that question. Um, mosses that have been in herbarium stresses for over 80 years have been dehydrated and have become reproductive for a few days. So all those specimens in the box, they're probably not dead, even though they've been packed for three or four years anyway. So I, I don't know that I can define for you what death is. <laughs> <laughs> what is the benefit of being What's the that's a great question. But I think that at the best is the best answer to that about twenty minutes ago. We would not be here without us. Nor would most other life. The uh the sphagnum band in the temperate part of the northern hemisphere. That that sphagnum band is about three or four miles wide. It binds up a huge amount of carbon that would otherwise still be free in the atmosphere with carbon dioxide. If that were there, the planet would be many degrees warmer than it is, and we would not be. So the first advantage to the environment is the environment would be here. If mosses weren't taking CO2 with that big temperate band of stagnant, if that weren't there binding up huge amounts of CO2 and carbon, we would not be here. The more that's the answer that I, that I like. That is so tangible. The other answer is the more usual one of we don't know what what little thing in there is a critical part of the environment that without which everything else would work. We don't know the answer to that. That's you can say that about any about any kind of We don't know how that impacts any of those things. It's more tangible to say we didn't have the second man. You can also add that in the particularly the maybe the more uh, BC temperate areas in the temperate forest, uh, the, the water dynamics. A lot of water in the, the water flow dynamics of forests and years are tied up in moss. And so they have a huge role there that we may not know too much about. John maybe can tell us a little more about it. Yes, 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 all kind of mixed in together. Uh, so there's, uh, there's lots of environmental influences going on where they're all kind of linked together and that doesn't surprise us. So we, it's sometimes hard to say, 
this one kind of organism has this, but this in conjunction with all the other things it's living with really has a massive effect on the earth. So, it's lost dopamine pollinators, right? Yeah. Does anything prey on Is there any critter that feeds on the mosses? Critter? Right here. Right here. Caribou? She's thinking of reindeer, that's probably reindeer true. moss, which is a lichen. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. In terms of things that feed on, on moss, not really. But if you look at them under the microscope, there are all kinds of things that live in the moss. Tardigrades are a small animal that actually does feed on moss. Most of you probably don't know. Have you heard of water bears? Yeah. That term? That's a tardigrade. Those, I believe, actually feed on moss. That's probably the only animal I can think of that feeds on moss. Bacteria can feed on moss. It'd be surprising if we had any organism that didn't have bacteria yeah. associated with it, I suppose. I'm not sure you can actually call that feed. It's great for us that's Tell them about the uh, iodine property property. Well, go okay, for it. You know more about that. Well, no, I'm likely to. Tell us about the iodine property property. Yeah. Go ahead. You mean the color changing? No, 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 no. The fact that they have. Uh, so during the First World War, iodine was used in massive, or sphagnum moss was used in massive tonnages that they gathered out of uh, uh, Great Britain and, the, and Ireland and that for uh, packing around wounds and soaking up the blood. But it also has, it produces kind of an iodine-like uh, chemical and uh, is an anti has antiseptic properties. So it was very effective. I see a lot of you nodding your head, and as long as you keep nodding, I'll probably keep talking. <laughs> I don't really you know, know all the details, but it was a very interesting kind of a, kind of a home remedy from, from the old days before antibiotics or those kinds of things. They were used as pulpus. Oh, they were used as pillow stuffing. They used all kinds of things. Other questions? Lichens and moss are very different. Lichens are a combination of fungus usually an algae, sometimes bacteria. So that lichens don't have anything much in common with the moss. They're mainly, the body of them is mainly a fungus. So there's no food value for an animal in moss. Well, you'd have to eat a whole bunch of it. Yeah. I'm not sure anybody's ever looked at it. Yeah, I don't know of anything where it's no, they're depending on mosses for food. Well, like a lichen has food value because the uh, animals eat it. Mm -hmm. So it's a combination of three plants. So um, lichen, two, a fungus, and either an alga or a cyanobacterium. Well, any kind of living thing has nutrition value because it all has the same essential proteins and what not. Mm -hmm. Please say what he said again. <laughs> I'm saying that about anything that grows is nutritious because it's all, you know, you don't have a different chemistry. You have more or less the same kind of chemistry throughout all living organisms. Okay. The only the only arena I throw in that parade is it doesn't mean we can digest it. No, that's true. Or that we ought to eat it. That's true. Yeah. Well, <laughs> plants do have well their, made. they have their defenses to keep from being eaten. Right, and we don't digest cellulose well, among other things that are in the plants. So mosses living by the edge of the streams, that do they primarily stabilize the stream bed? They do. Okay, and then they hold water. They, they hold water and they release water the back in when they start to grow up. And they they host a huge number of microorganisms. Mm -hmm. so you shrink yourself down further and further and further, you see all kinds of things. Really, they don't necessarily eat them on. Rotifers, ever heard of rotifers? I see rotifers all the time. Those little things that have little wheels on top that go spinning, and you can see things moving through little puppies come out. I didn't have a good microscope. You can see this. They're called rotifers. They're really funny. They look like they have little spinning wheels on top, and little particles in them to digest. You see them all? Very, very pretty. Tardigrades, these little water bears, you see them on certain times. 
types of mosses and minorities in certain places not of that Sometimes you bring these critters home with you. Just the other day, I hear a little screech from my wife in the other room. I've been out collecting, and uh, the, the particular way that I collect requires that I open up my moss packets to let them dry after I've brought them home. Well, sometimes the critters in there crawl out, and here's this little wormy-like thing about this long crawling along that suddenly my wife sees, you know, so. Who knows what's scattered around the house now? <laughs> the nice thing about my wife, my wife is she's a rhyologist. Yeah, she's, she's ready for that. <laughs> well, that, oh, go ahead. If you, can't, if you can't kill a moss by drying it out, what can you use to kill it? Well, there are a lot of things. Uh, it turns out that mosses, for instance, most mosses are, are very unstable. They don't live through a lot of chemical insults. So a lot of the very easily attainable chemicals we put mosses to start with. So in all of our wisdom, we're likely to be able to get chemicals. Yeah, you know, it's, it's actually not hard at all to kill moss. On the roadside, if they don't want moss on the roadside, it's a biggest concern. Is it, is it copper or iron that you make something spray? Well, any herbicide. Any herbicide. There's all kinds of stuff you can It's not hard. You're in the killing. That's easy. <laughs> Most of us are. <laughs> It turns out that the fragmenting is a common way that mosses, especially in Eric and Mexico, if you take a moss, whack it, make 500 different pieces out of it, and throw it to the wind, if it lands in a place that's moist enough, no sunlight, it'll grow all your moss. It'll love being fragmented. When you, when you pick up a piece of moss in the field, if you're with us tomorrow, we'll pick up a piece of moss, look at it, throw it away. There's a pretty good chance you've just created a new moss. We haven't hurt the moss yet. They love it. You've helped it. Good question.